include Paradise Lost, I should have got beyond this already and I failed uh, abysmally. So I'm going to catch up and then we're going to try and catch up with the actual subject matter of today. This lecture, which is Pope's Rape of the Lock, but I can't neglect the conclusion of this. Uh, what we've had in the intervening three chapters, chapters 10, 11, 12, is God coming down to judge Adam and Eve. So the conclusion of what we're given in Genesis 3 and uh, the interaction between God and the woman, God speaking to the serpent, Adam interaction, so that sort of business. And the 11 and 12, or uh, some of 10 and certainly 11 and into 12, gives an account of mankind as it plays out over history up to the point of uh, Milton's day. So he gives an account of uh, a biblic of biblical history all the way up to the present. And in this, he is echoing what happens in Virgil's Aeneid. If you recall, when, when uh, Aeneas goes down to the underworld, he sees an account of, the, of his ancestors, uh, or rather his, the generations that come after him, leading to the uh, foundation of Rome as a, as a city, to then becoming a republic, to then becoming an empire, etc. So all of that playing out, and the, uh, the coming of a golden age under Augustus Caesar, etc. So the, the whole span of history is told uh, in the underworld, and then he comes out of the underworld and then goes into Italy to try and make this new empire happen. So it's a, it's a look forward in that sense, because remember Aeneas is founding a place that does not yet exist. Similarly here, following the uh, sort of the Aeneian template, uh, that's what we have here, an account of what happens after Adam to all the generations of mankind up to the present. And, um, and so we get this all the way to the point of the incarnation, death and resurrection and ascension of Christ, and then the state of the church all the way up to the second coming and everything that will happen in with this. And I'm gonna pick it up overlooking the majority of that and pick it up right in the middle of this reference to the incarnation, etc. And uh, Adam's response is, oh goodness, infinite goodness immense, that all this good of evil shall produce and evil turn to good. Remember, uh, uh, Satan's boast was that to evil be thou my good. And, uh, and God is undoing all that uh, and by, by means of the cross and that God himself will become man. And this is, of course, not in view at the outset in the original creation. And so an even better thing, God is brought closer to man. Man is brought up into the deity in the sense that a, a, man, a man, now Christ, is now in the Godhead where before he was not. And, and, with, and, and we, the bride of Christ, the body, the church, are brought into such close proximity to God as well. No longer just walking with God in, in the garden, but actually into the very proximity of uh, the triune God and so forth. So he said, more wonderful than that which by creation first brought forth light out of darkness. Full of doubt I stand whether I should repent me now of sin by me done and occasioned, or rejoice much more, that much more good thereof shall spring to God, more glory, more good will to men from God, and over wrath grace shall abound. Which is what the Father said uh, in light of the original sin that had not yet been committed, at least from the vantage point of the story. Remember, God is outside space and time. But grace would be shown, and here's the effect of that. But say, if our deliverer up to heaven must reascend, what will betide the few his faithful left among the unfaithful herd? And then he tells the account of human history. But let me skip on with that. Uh, from that and he at the conclusion of this says um, greatly instructed I shall hence depart greatly in peace of thought and have my fill of knowledge remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but now I have all the knowledge that I need I'm filled with this that which this vessel can contain beyond which was my folly to aspire my, he's now speaking on behalf of Eve. So man, the, uh, that 
creature that bears God's image sought to know what he ought not to. Now he knows more. Henceforth I learn that to obey is best and love with fear the only God, to walk as in his presence, ever to observe his providence, and on him soul depend, merciful over all his works, with good still overcoming evil, and by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak, subverting worldly strong, and worldly wise by simply meek. That suffering for truth's sake is fortitude to highest victory and to the faithful death the gate of life. So everything that seems contradicted from the world's vantage point by the cross, the cross sees sin and shame and guilt and weakness and death in the cross. It's the exact opposite that is going on there. God shows his strength at the cross. He overcomes sin and death. It, his life, the death of our Lord is our life. He takes on our sin, we get his righteousness, etc. That he's, he's preaching the theology of the cross here, effectively. And this is what Adam says, taught this by his example, whom I now acknowledge my Redeemer blessed. And the angel says in response, to whom, thus also the angel last replied, this having learned, thou hast obtained the sum of wisdom. Hope no higher, though all the stars thou knewest by name and all the ethereal powers, all secrets of the deep, all nature's works, or works of God in heaven, air, earth, or sea, and all the riches of this world enjoys, and all the rule, one empire. Only add deeds to thy knowledge answerable. Add faith, add virtue, patience, temperance, add love, by come, name to come called charity, the soul of all the rest. And then thou wilt not be loath to leave this paradise, but shalt possess a paradise within thee happier far. That's the point I want to emphasize there. You'll have a paradise within you. So why is it just being uh, an internalized paradise? So he's, been, he's gonna be expelled from paradise, right? In the words that are just about to fall, that Adam and Eve are gonna be expelled. And you'll note that they go hand in hand. Remember the reference to the hands. And the paradise will be within them. Is just, are these just happy thoughts? Is that what's... You, so you'll be consoled by the knowledge of what you've just heard. Is that going to be the paradise? Is it in, in, an intellectual thing solely? Is it pie in the sky when you die? Is that what Milton is saying? I don't think it is, but you could construe it to be that way. Milton, who, uh, remember, was on, in uh, support of Cromwell's government and its Republican aims, trying to establish a more perfect Christian community on earth, which the tyrant Charles I would not allow them to do. They were not allowed to worship freely. They had to worship in the popish ways that Charles declared they would, and he was he was simply an impossible man to negotiate with. He would go back on his word, etc., and they were willing to go forward. So is Milton renouncing any worldly um, expression of the Christian faith, or is it just blessed thoughts? It's not abundantly clear here, by the way, um, but it seems to me that uh, based on what he's done before that, this, there is more to it than that, that it's simply paradise within it's that you can't be thrown out of this paradise is what is meant even though you're politically exiled or you should lose your worldly goods you cannot lose heaven because God has come to you and he won't leave you the deposit of the Holy Spirit has meant that you are already in some sense not yet because you're still alive you haven't died yet but you you are guaranteed that you will be in the presence of God eternally. That's what's being said. So it's not against any political expression. It's rather you can't be thrown out of this paradise because God has gifted it to you by grace. And if he's given it to you and you did nothing to earn it, you can't lose it. It's your eternal security. That's what he's saying. It's not a sort of Quakerist retreat from the world um, expression. But if you hear this and you add faith, virtue, patience, temperance, love, 
then you won't be loath to do these things. So there has to be, it's not just faith, you have to act in accordance with this. Anyway, so he says, let us descend now therefore from this top of speculation for the hour precise exacts are parting hence and see the guards, so the, fl- the cherubim with their flaming swords that are about to cast them out. And they are going to go now. And they descend the hill, Adam to the bower where Eve lay sleeping, ran before, but found her waked. And thus with words, not sad she him received. Whence thou returns and whither whence I know. For God is also in sleep and dreams advise, which he hath sent propitious, some great good presaging, since with sorrow and heart's distress wearied I fell asleep. But now lead on in me is no delay with thee to go is to stay here with without thee here to stay is to go hence unwilling thou to me art all things under heaven all places thou who for my willful crime aren't banished hence note that she he is everything to her he's all places remember the separation of the parents so there's a lot about unity they're one flesh they're one spirit they're united to god there's a lot going on here um, in literary fashion so, and, and she knows that although all by me is lost such favor, I unworthy am vouchsafed, by me the promised seed shall all restore. So she understands the gospel. So spake our mother, even Adam heard well pleased, but answered not for now, too nigh the archangel stood, and from the other hill to their fixed station, all in bright array the cherubim descended. On the ground gliding meteorous, as evening mist risen from a river or the marish glides and gathers round fast at the laborers heel homeward branding and the angel goes before them and casts them out and they don't want to go and so he grabs them by the arms and says oh no you're coming with me like because they're tarrying the angels with dreadful faces thronged in fiery arms some natural tears they dropped but wiped them soon the world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest and providence their guide. They, hand in hand with wandering steps and slow through Eden, took their solitary way. These lines are an echo, a literary echo of what Moses sees when he's on Mount Pisgah overlooking the promised land. He sees a land that he will not go into. Remember, he's, he dies on the mountain. He's not going there. But they are going into the land. But at first, the world is all before them. Uh, words that are echoed, by the way, in uh, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations at the end. Th- or this passage that is, is echoed. Literature will do this. So Milton is echoing scripture. Dickens is echoing Milton, you'll find that this happens all the time. And, and so there, there's a great tradition of texts that will be built up. I mean, Milton was referring to scripture, Virgil, Homer, whatever, and they are meant to be read together, side by side, on top of one another to some degree, and they're adding to it, intensifying, or in the case of Milton, giving what true heroism is, which is the contradiction to what the the, uh, the Greco-Roman tradition said, right? This is what a hero is, and it's Christ. He's the Redeemer. He's the God who becomes man. He's the second Adam. The first Adam lost everything. The second Adam gained everything that was lost, and then more so through humility, uh, through love, etc. So a very much of a, a dependent epic on the... Uh, on the conventions that have been established of the epic, and yet he transforms the epic uh, in ways that were incomprehensible before that and, and makes it, to me, the great work of Western literature. The great work, par excellence, bar none. That's my own personal view. Comments or questions? You don't have to agree with me on that, although you will eventually. <laughs> yes. Yes. It is reflected in his work. A fair bit. Um, 
but I think his Christianity is not very well thought out, and it's more, it is utilized there, though, for sure. And that passage there in uh, Great Expectations, in which Pip leaves with his beloved, with hand in hand, walking through the garden. It's actually a garden that they're in. It's a gated garden, as Mrs. Haversham's. Um, his great expectations are fulfilled. He's, they're like an Adam and Eve walking out of the garden, going into the world. Um, he's echoing Milton. Now, is he echoing the same message as Milton? I don't think so. But he's bringing it to mind, the reader's mind, a, a, a learned reader's mind is, it should reflect on that. And whenever you, in literature, read about gardens, you think about the original garden and all the instances of gardens that arise after that. Uh, so you start to develop a literary imagination and think of the precedents and the, that were used uh, in these situations and what the various importance of those were in those works and see how the later authors are interacting with those. And, and good authors are well read and are making those connections because they're in their own minds. These are very important things and I want to engage with that seriously. Just like a musician will have heard other musicians play and they are interacting with them. Sometimes they do like a remix and it's very self-conscious. Most remixes are terrible because they're just repeating the same thing more or less. There's not really much added to it aside from their voice. That's a pretty superficial thing to add. Their voice is often not as good as the original artist, right? So they add a little bit of, I don't know, more contemporary instrumental type stuff. So maybe you might prefer that, but it's, it's basically repeating the same thing. Well, that's not what I'm talking about here. The tradition adds on to what's before and to some degree transforms it. Um, in our day, we've run out of ideas and run out of good artistry, pretty much. Uh, in part, this is my own theory, because we have departed from the source of truth and beauty and goodness, uh, namely Christ, a culture that we're living off the fumes of past generations. So anyway, I added that little bit in. Any other comments or questions? And the result of that is education is collapsing like a Tower of Babel all around us. And the great news is that you're in the, uh, in the presence of the collapse which means that there are huge opportunities. So it depends how, what sort of person you are. So if you want to see it as doom and gloom, you're correct. But if you want to see it as terrific uh, opportunity, unprecedented opportunity that the tower is finally coming down, then you would be warranted in seeing that and seeing, okay, so now the time is the time for the church to arise and take her place. I see it that way myself. It's an opportunity. But anyway, I'll leave it for that. <laughs>